All right, so I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Jimmy Wasson, who many of you might have gotten a little brief introduction to him when he was on with uh, with Brad Orsini from the Secure Community Network, which is the Jewish Federation's greater arm that provides security briefings, knowledge, uh, and information to community organizations, synagogues, federations, of course, and the many different um, groups that are all tied into the big Jewish community umbrella. So Jimmy, though, is a local um, security director for the JCC of Scottsdale. But when I say, I mean, I don't want anyone to compartmentalize and think, oh, Scottsdale, that's not Phoenix, that's not um, Prescott, that's not Tucson. One of the, I would say, the greatest assets, I'm being, I say this from personal experience, uh, to the Jewish community here in the regards to security and target hardening, which is one of the words that Homeland Security likes to use, which is to make your own site, building, synagogue, it could even be a restaurant or whatever your business is, just safer um, and more prepared for any type of security breach or attack. Um, so Jimmy has been tremendous in this community, for sure for the JCC, um, and then as an asset, helping other organizations like us um, be better prepared. So today, uh, what we've what we have Jimmy uh, invited on to do, and of course we're giving him uh, free reign. So if he chooses slightly uh, topics to the sides of this general conversation, is really talking about protecting ourselves in the sense. And re his title is response to violence: how we can be better prepared to react more appropriately to something that is an unknown, um, a surprise, uh, to be less surprised as I would like to think of it. Um, and this is not just in the sense of being Jewish, which is the, the thing that I have taken from the different trainings that I sat through. But in general, you go out, are you prepared? A Walmart had an attack in Texas. What's my automatic reaction? Do I know where I'm supposed to go? Did I think about it? So it's really, I think an eye-opening and thought-provoking um, conversation, regardless if you get all the answers today or more of, okay, I should start thinking. And actually one of the things I love that Jimmy shared before he did a training for us here in, uh, at our Chabad in Phoenix was he said that there was a synagogue and I hope I'm not stealing Jimmy's words, but there was a synagogue in Scottsdale that wanted him to present. They couldn't find a time that worked really well for all their members at the same time. So he went on a Saturday on a Shabbat and spoke, I think, about 15 minutes. But one of the things that he shared, and I, I was not there, but he shared the story with me, and I, I said, wow, that's, that's something that's um, so important to think about, was he asked everyone who was sitting in the room, what is your closest exit? If something happens right now, where are you going? And he said, and I did the same thing uh, in our shul, that people started looking over their shoulders. Where is the closest door in this room if I had to run out? <laughs> Um, and that mindset is so important, uh, again, of course, being Jewish, but I think just in the state of where we are in this world. Um, and, and therefore, uh, when we had Brad Rossini on, Brad was actually telling me, he's like, why do you need me? You have Jimmy. He knows Jimmy really well. And I said, you know what? I wanted him to do it from a really big bird's eye view of the global or for sure in the national sense. Um, but he really pushed for Jimmy and he brought Jimmy on. And I know that from the feedback and, and everyone that joined then, I think everyone wanted Jimmy. <laughs> so uh, I've been wrong more than once. That was just one of the times. Uh, I'm going to uh, share the floor with Jimmy. I'm going to um, spotlight him. If you do have questions, definitely um, you can use the chat or unmute your mic if you're seeing the note that it's not being responsive. And I know Jimmy will get to those uh, questions as he is able to. So Jimmy uh, Wasson. Thank you very much. And again, Jimmy, I didn't share a background actually. In addition to his current role as director of security for the Ina Levine Jewish Community Campus, and of course, the extra um, parts that really are community minded, not this, just the campus. Uh, his background is actually as a retired uh, lieutenant for Scottsdale Police Department and the commander of their SWAT team. Uh, so without any uh, further introductions, Jimmy, you're welcome to share and fill in some blanks on that. But uh, Jimmy Wasson, thank you. Rabbi, thank you so much. I, I appreciate uh, the introduction. And yeah, just very quickly, uh, in case anybody doesn't know, I started out in, um, in New York back in 1986 as a police officer and came out here in the early, early 1990. And my background was uh, 
well, I was obviously, I was with Scottsdale for tool when I retired about three and a half years ago. My background was, was in uh, patrol and it was in SWAT. So I have a very heavy background in tactics. So whenever I talk about situational awareness, um, it really comes down to everybody's individual situational awareness and what the, what's going on around them and to be responsible for kind of your own safety. And, um, and that's, that's one of the really areas that I, that I come out is that mindset and, and having decisions, having a plan in place before things happen. So for this presentation, what, I, what I've done is these virtual ones are kind of a little different. So I put some videos in here that I don't make, that I think are really crucial to talk about situational awareness is because we're, we're on this new platform and it's hard to see exactly how it's perceived on the other side because we're missing that face-to-face -face contact. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. And, um, and these are, you know, we start, this is, in the rap is exactly right. We used to call these active shooter trainings, but we don't, um, we got away from that a while ago. I started calling them response to violence because things can happen anytime, any place. Uh, we talk about domestic violence spilling into the workplace. You could be at a, at a store and something could happen. Uh, so, you know, we always kind of get in that mindset of, the bad guy coming through the door with a, with the rifles. And that certainly is a possibility, but just keep in mind that active violence can happen. Like the rabbi just said, when you're shopping, when you're out to dinner. And um, so that's kind of what, uh, when we talk about that mindset. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and see if this works. Share the screen. There it is. Share. Does everybody see that? Is that, does that come out all right? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so just what we'll talk today is we're just going to discuss a little bit about what kind of pre-violence indicators look like, uh, mindset. And last year, about a year and a half ago, uh, SCAN put on a, we went and did a conference and we talked about the tree of life and we talked about lessons that were learned. Um, I'd like to kind of talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about that, having a plan, the all important situational uh, awareness response to violence and, and things that we can do in the future as this moves on. So um, uh, Tree of Life put on, put, uh, produced a, a video that I thought was very, very moving um, and it came out very nice. Not, um, um, I don't know if anybody has seen this or not. So it's just a couple minutes. I'd just like to play it before we get started. Um, and Hey, Jimmy. Yes. Can you pause it for a second? I'm going to give you a setting that should give you a better audio. On the top of your menu, on the top of the screen? Yes. Um, you should have like a drop down that says optimize for video and audio. Do you see it? Like not that floating dock on top? Remote. Um, let's see. I see. Yeah. Microphone, speakers, audio settings. It should be on top though, like by the share settings. Like you have a maybe a little dock on top. Yes, it says security, participants, share, automate. So is there a drop down over there for the, cause I know that you can optimize this for audio. Optimize, and share, full screen video clip. Yes, that will give us better audio when it goes through. Okay, should I try it again? Yeah, you did audio and video, right? Unless you've seen. Perfect. Is it working? Yeah. Mm. Okay. War. Unless you're an ER doc in a trauma center, unless you're on the SWAT team, you cannot imagine what the scene looked like. They die just because they do. They die just because they try to find a peaceful time to connect to God. It never stops for us, for me. 
Last year, Uncle Judah had his 80th birthday celebration at the synagogue and did his bar mitzvah again. Yeah. And all of, these all of these people were there. Every one of them that were killed in the Tree of Life congregation were there. And it's, for him, it's very sad that they're not there anymore. We were in the same congregation, in the same seats, where many of the victims perished eight months later. It was bad, especially thinking that someday, when everything is going to be rebuilt, it could take at least a year, and those seats are going to be empty, and it's going to be a little tough. And to walk into this beautiful synagogue, in this sanctuary, where people were doing nothing but praying, and to get gunned down, is beyond reprehensible. So to, try to and so to try to rationalize that, you can't. You just can't. The entire federation, the entire federation system, system, including the network of independent communities, uh, had, a uh, had a very hands-on response to what happened in, to Pittsburgh. What happened in uh, Pittsburgh. One of the things that we did, uh, one of the and uh, I would imagine that folks in Wilmington through their local synagogues were involved as well, as we organized Solidarity Shabbats. Those Solidarity Shabbats took place the Shabbat the week after the incident in, in Pittsburgh. And it was a time, it was a try, time to share feelings, to mourn, but also to stand tall on behalf of the Jewish people. People who were killed only because they were Jewish, and they represent the entirety of the Jewish people, because to the killer, they represented the entirety of the Jewish people. And these 11 were Kedoshim, were holy mourners. They, they were killed for one reason, one reason only, that uh, they represented all of us. But one message came from it. We are one, we are one united. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not the pieces, we are in one division, that care about the community needs and the community help us. That's the lesson. I said that the people in the city, although Pittsburgh was never known to be anti-Semitic or anything like that, but not just here, around the country, how it united the whole country in grief for 11 Jews. I think that was amazing. That was a wonderful experience for me. Two years and two months ago, in the very first synagogue I was ever in, I asked, do you get hate mail? They said, oh, sure. What do you do with it? We throw it away. Those days are gone. Rabbi, can you hear me? Yeah. Did you pause that? Um, not intentionally. No. If we're, it's almost to the end. If we want to move on. Okay. Yeah. I mean, whatever your 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 goal, you're good. Whatever you'd like. All right. Please move this. Oh, we hear you well. Okay. It looks like it froze up on my end. Oh. Okay. Move on. So if you want, I can stop you from sharing and that might give you back. Yeah, let me try that. Sorry about this. No, don't worry. We're happy you're presenting. Thank you. Uh, stop the share. There you go. All right. Looks like we're back. Share screen. And if you're not doing the video, just uncheck those. Don't, don't optimize for a video. Oh, I see your PowerPoint. Uh, OK. Okay. Maybe, yeah, just close the PowerPoint in the meantime and then. Don't worry, Jimmy. We already have a record of technical issues and you can't beat it. <laughs> if anyone remembers uh, when we had 
the emergency response uh, in New York City who uh, we couldn't get his video to work, then his audio didn't work, then he called him from a phone. So take your time, don't worry about it. All right, I apologize. No, you don't have to worry. See, this is Jimmy's training. He doesn't get phased. <laughs> okay, I think we're back almost on there. Okay. All right. Are we back? Yeah. Okay. And, you, and if you're not showing a video, I guess you can leave it. If, if the menu gets in the way, I'll let you know. Okay, so we'll just move on. Um, so what we want to do when we talk about um, things like acts of violence, the, the most important thing is to have that mindset, is to have a plan, to know if something was to happen right now, if everybody's you know, sitting at home right now and somebody was to knock at your door and um, uh, you know, it was somebody you didn't recognize you know, during the day, it's very common to have what we call door kick burglary. So if somebody kicked it, knocked at your door, you didn't recognize, what would you do? Um, always have that kind of that plan. Would you say, uh, I'm calling the police? Or would you answer the door or not answer the door to have kind of that plan, that predetermined uh, mindset, what we always say in law enforcement, but what that does is it shortens your decision-making time and, and when a crisis does unfold. Um, if you're trying to figure out what we say, if if something's unfolding and you're trying to figure out what your plan is, chances are it's going to be too late because you're going to, you need to uh, have that plan in place. When, when an act of violence unfolds, moments are very, very important, but seconds are critical. Um, you have to act as quickly as you can, put your plan into place. And what we want to do is we want to buy time. I have a video coming up and this is a video of the shooting in um, uh, Fort Lauderdale. And I just want to, the reason I put this video in here is I just want you to look really quickly and see how quick this can unfold. And when you watch the shooter, when he takes the gun out of his, out of his uh, jacket, watch the people around him, how they react. This guy still managed to, to kill five people down in Florida and just watch, watch the folks around him. The attack came without warning as seen on this airport surveillance video obtained by TMZ. 26-year-old Esteban Santiago pulls out his pistol and opens fire. Passengers run for cover as Santiago moves out of camera range through the baggage claim section, where police say he emptied his 9mm semi-automatic handgun and then reloaded once, killing five people and injuring six more. Tonight, the question is why a man who told the FBI he was hearing voices about ISIS thought the government had put a chip in his head was able to keep his gun even after being hospitalized for a mental examination. The gun was taken away from him, but it was is given back after he was uh, cleared. A question put to the Broward County Sheriff, Scott Israel. Do you think he should have had that gun? Well, no. Um, can everybody hear me? Rabbi? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. So that was, I think that was probably one of the most outrageous questions. She says, do you think he should have had the gun? And, and the sheriff says, well, no, what do you, uh, you know, kind of a kind of ridiculous question, but whatever the intent is, if it's a perceived wrong or it's some sort of mental illness, um, these folks will take targets along the way, whether it's a workplace violence, domestic violence. The important takeaway is that these situations stop until um, the person will stop, barricade, and commit suicide. Or secondly, they'll stop by people on the property. And that's us. That's everybody that's on this call right now. We are, in essential, the, are the first responders to our, own prop, to our own situation. And that's the key. And that's why that, that, um, that situational awareness and decision-making um, is so crucial. You see how quickly that unfolded. And, um, and that's why, the, again, that's looking around, making sure you know where the exits are and all that is absolutely critical. Like, like the rabbi pointed out, I always say whether you're at, um, at, at a shul or um, you, you know, a place that you visit often, the first time you go through an emergency door should not be in an emergency. Um, it, you should always have that plan of action, what, what you're going to do. So these things are unpredictable. You see how quickly they happen. And again, citizen intervention is, is uh, 
is the second um, second line to stop these. Law enforcement is great, um, but they will. It takes them, you know, 90 seconds maybe to get there. They have to form up, figure out what's going on, and make entry. So again, our safety and our um, is really in our hands and how and how we handle how we handle this. Being vigilant and informed uh, and prepared uh, is is most definitely will save your life or could save lives of people around you. And I completely, completely believe that, believe in that. So just a couple of statistics on, on um, that we know now. Last year, uh, the Secret Service, they put out a very comprehensive report. Um, it's this one here. It's, it's uh, targeted, people that are targeted by uh, um, active shooters. And a couple of statistics come out of this that all of these folks were um, consumers of mental or emotional services all of them had some, with the exception of the Las Vegas shooter, that there was some sort of emotional leakage, that there was something in, uh, um, they had said something to somebody, some people had noticed something that wasn't quite right and didn't say anything, or they, um, they had something on Instagram, Facebook, uh, there was some sort of emotional leakage that wasn't, that wasn't picked up on. 55% had a connection to the organization and 45% had no connection. So God forbid something like this happens, there's, you know, there's a chance that we might, we might know who this person is. And that comes, that goes to the point of um, when you see something, uh, uh, somebody exhibiting behavior that's not right, it's imperative that you say something. Um, and we'll get into uh, in just a minute what happened, you know, the consequences. Um, and then when we talk about domestic violence spilling into the workplace, um, that happens uh, quite, quite a bit. And again, um, the mindset of, well, I, and I believe it or not, I've heard this. Um, I've done training in synagogues and I've heard it from people say, well, we're doing this training only because um, the congregants want it, but this is, will not happen at the synagogue. Um, and uh, I heard, I've heard that a few uh, more times than not. And that's kind of a mindset that um, is just really not a realistic uh, mindset. The, um, the, the Overland, Texas, the shooting in Overland, Texas, that community that um, was, I could, you couldn't find it on a map if, if I gave you 20 minutes, but yet a guy went into uh, that church and killed, I think it was 17 people. And that town was just a tiny, uh, uh, very tiny little town. So nobody is at more risk or less risk than others. Um, and again, this is when you're, when you're by your So why is this training important? Um, train, I always believe training and repetitive training is, is absolutely the key. Um, when, we're, when we're under stress, and this is Colonel John Boyd put this together, is as human beings, when we see an act of violence or something is, uh, somebody is perpetrating violence to us, we have to basically, uh, uh, we observe the situation, we have to orientate ourselves to what is going on, figure out, um, and there's a whole, slew of information that I, I won't get into. We, we could talk for a couple hours just on this alone, where you orientate yourself to what the issue is, and then you have to make your decision, and then you act. And that's what we call um, an OODA loop. And um, the more we train and the more repetitive training that we do, the smaller and the shorter that this, this process and quicker this process um, becomes. So um, when we do a lot of this training, a lot of it is kind of repetitive, and um, it's but repetitiveness is the mother of all, of all training. I did a, a radio class here at the J and somebody, one of the person, people came up and they said, do we have to do this again? And uh, I said, well, yes, because again, it's the repetitive that just under stress, we go back to what we're trained to do. There's an expression, someone, you ever heard the expression, the person rose to the occasion? People don't rise to the occasion, they fall back to their training. So uh, training, and to me, it's, uh, this is just absolutely critical. So that mindset, any action that you take in response to violence, and it's gonna involve risk to yourself or the people that are with you. Um, I always kind of say you have to risk a lot to save a lot and make decisions that you can live with. Um, I hear this, um, you know, we don't wanna have to have that mindset, well, if I, if I had only said something or I knew something was wrong or this, this is a critical thing, I hear people say, what are the chances? Um, I've had people up living up here in North Scottsdale um, when we're at their house and, and responding to a crime and said, well, what are the chances this could happen up here? Anything can happen anytime. Um, and that's just, just a, a 
that's a critical mindset. So awareness, um, situational awareness. You must understand the situation and your awareness. That predetermined mindset, what that does is it helps you give, um, it helps you uh, hasten the decision-making process. So if you walk into a, uh, a store or a restaurant, you say, look around and you say, okay, there's an exit over there. I, if there's something over here, this is what I'm going to do. Um, like I said, use the example, if somebody say, knocked at your door right now, you didn't recognize the guy, he knocks at the door, he's looking around, what, what would you do? But if you think about that situation now, when it happens, you'll already have your plan in place. And we avoid that freeze response where when something does happen, people will freeze. And I call that kind of a situational denial. Um, we just don't want to, we don't want to, we don't have time to go into that freeze response as you saw in that video in Florida. If you have to think about what it, to do, it's probably going to be too late. Do we run? Do we hide? Do we fight? Under stress and, um, um, and, and violent crimes, people will either lead or they will, uh, they will, lead, will either lead or be led. And that's just, um, it takes that one person to, um, to make the decision and lead the crowd and take people to safety. Rabbi, I'm just confirming, can everybody hear me? Are you still, am we still good? Yeah, you're still good. Okay. Do you want people to unmute their mics just so you get feedback or? No, no, you're good. Oh. I'm, I'm good because I, under this, I can't see anybody. So I just want to oh, make sure okay. that I'm still good. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's so now, again, it's a talk, it's talking about exits, um, visualizing how you would get out of a violent situation um, before one unfolds. And we talk about violence, but uh, I'm going to show you, there's another video coming up here um, when we talk about, uh, we talk about violence, but um, this next video is actually, it's a fire that happens up at um, a nightclub in Massachusetts. And it's kind of hard to watch, but, um, and I'll play it here. And what happened is people, they only, there were exits all over, but they only went to the exit where they knew and a lot of people perished. Um, so it's about being prepa uh, prepared, again, not paranoid. And then it's also, this is cr critical, is never ignore your gut feelings, um, your instincts. Your instincts will never portray you. Uh, um, they just, they, they don't, that's your survival instinct kick, kicking in. I've been to numerous, uh, officer involved shootings where I interview the officer after the shooting and every one of them will tell me usually two things. Um, they'll say, I had a bad feeling about this call. And the, um, and the other one was, I just, it was just like training the situation unfolded. I did exactly what I was trained to do. And I, um, I used to be the advanced training sergeant. So when I would hear an officer say, it was just like training, it made me feel good because that's, that's, the, that's the key, is that repetitive training again and again and again. So this video here, what this is, is these people are in a nightclub and a fire breaks out and you'll kind of just watch and, and, and then we'll just discuss it very briefly. there is 31 people perished right in that doorway because they all went to the exact place that they had come into the into the uh, event that last scream that you heard we call that a primal scream that when people are truly uh, in fear or are or, or, or dying that's that primal scream so if you look at the, the slide this slide you see the 31 in the center there but if you look, there's a stage exits, there's exits behind the stage, there's exits behind the main bar. 
uh, there's windows, but everybody went to the same, they all panicked, went to the same, um, the same exit where they had come in and 31 people uh, perished during that. So again, it goes, just goes to the point, whenever, whenever you go anywhere, you should always have that plan. I tell people when they come into the JCC or you should always look around, um, um, know what you're going to do. If you have questions, ask. And, um, but if you, um, if you're looking for that exit, if you, if you ever notice those little, um, when you're in a room and they have those little maps that say you are here and it's got a little red arrow where to go. If you're looking at a little map to figure things out in like a situation like that, it's, it's, it's too late. You should always have that plan ahead of time. So um, we talk about acts of violent hiding and hoping should, and I know I've discussed this before, should never be part of your mindset. Um, never surrender your fate to anybody else. You're, you are responsible for your own safety. Um, uh, you're responsible, take actions, again, that you can live with and be decisive um, and, uh, and well prepared. Um, don't ever think somebody else is gonna um, take care of your problem. Have a plan, always have a plan wherever you go um, and whatever, whatever you're doing. So I know I, I'm not obsessed with fire or anything, but I always had this, I tell this story that whenever I get on an airplane, I, uh, when I talk about my mindset, I, when I sit down, I always, um, uh, they say, you know, look at the exits and know where they're at. I always count the amount of seats to the exit nearest to me. So my plan when I go on an airplane is if the airplane fills, fills up with smoke and you can't see, I've counted the amount of exits to uh, seat rows to the nearest exit because my plan is I'm not gonna go to the middle aisle because that's where everybody's gonna go. And when people start uh, panicking and getting their luggage out of the overhead luggage where the airplane's on fire, I will be able to escape. I'll help people, but I'm not gonna get trapped in an airplane that I can't see. And I've, that's always been my plan. And this video I found, I'm just gonna play it very quickly. I just want you to notice when people exit the airplane, watch what's in their hands and watch what they're doing. And I think it's very telling about uh, having a having that 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 plan. This plane catches on fire in uh, I believe it's Texas. Can everybody see okay? We all, we all see it. And I, I put that in there again. If you notice, people were leaving the airplane with their uh, with their carry on bags, and in, in a situation as as desperate and as dire as that, that people actually stop to get the personal items, and that's why it's a, I always have my plan. Um, I know what I'm going to do if something like that had happened, and um, um, and I think that speaks to that that uh, that survival mindset. Again, it's knowing what's going on around you, know what you're capable of. Um, I've had a conversation with a couple folks since our last meeting and had conversations about firearms and what we're capable about doing, you know, firearms and, and what's maybe a better fit, but it's again, and never deny what's going on around you. If you hear, if you hear gunshots, um, I, and I hear this all the time, I've seen this, well, people say, well, I thought it was firecrackers. Trust me, if you're in, in a, in a synagogue or the JCC and you hear what you think of are uh, a popping noises, it's not firecrackers. Nobody's bringing firecrackers into a synagogue. I can guarantee you that. React to what you're hearing. Don't sit, don't go into that situational denial where people kind of look around and they say, well, what was that? It, it might have been uh, firecrackers or whatever. Act immediately and quickly and with purpose. Um, you have to avoid that freeze reaction where people, again, just kind of, they don't move and we lose those precious, precious seconds. Um, we don't deny what you're hearing and seeing absolutely react to it. Seconds are absolutely
Did we lose Jimmy? I think he froze. And I don't know what the next slide is to teach it, so. But we'll see if his uh, computer gets get back online. Any questions so far while we wait? Feel free to unmute. I'll make sure. I think his computer froze. Well, Jimmy, my question there? was, in the airport, people didn't leave. They huddled together. They should have left. Right. Out of the area. Oh, I think he just logged off. Let's get him back on. I mean, that's what he was showing, but I think his real point was showing that you need to know where to go yes. in addition to that. To get out. To have a plan. All right, we'll see what he... Uh... Izzy Lipschitz has a theory that because so many people are back online for school... Oh, oh okay, I think he's back on. Hold on. Did Jimmy come back on? Are we back? Yeah, you're back. Perfect. All right. Sorry. I feel terrible about this. All right. We'll Don't see. worry. We, we, we have a theory. It's because everyone's doing homeschooling. <laughs> you know, actually, we have that J all day, and we have a lot of kids in the building that are doing that. So, Never all right, let me pick this, pick this back up if I can. So what I'm about to share now is this is a slide when we move into the lessons learned from Pittsburgh, which I think is so, so important. Um, Try this and can everybody see that? Yeah. What this is, um, if you notice that, um, then this is a, an extended timeline. What I'm just going to kind of do though is the shooting started at 9 15, 9 50 a.m. Um, yeah, it was when he walked into the, the uh, suspect walked into the synagogue from 9 51 to the first shots were fired to 9 54. It took, um, no one called uh, the police department. Um, that's four minutes. That's an incredibly amount, a uh, long amount of time. Um, the reason I even bring this up is that um, once the police were called, they were they responded with that within 90 seconds. And once the police showed up, there was absolutely no more loss of life because uh, the shooter had um, went from um, being the on the offensive to the defensive. So when we talk about that situational denial and the, and, the, and the loss of critical seconds, it's so important. It's so important to get those first responders rolling because we know now statistically, once the cops even show up on scene, the, the, turf, the tables do turn. So um, when we talk about that situational denial, please don't deny if you think you're hearing shots, um, act quickly and appropriately. If you call 911 and you get things rolling and something turns out that it's not what you think it is, you can always call 911 back. Okay, so anyway, so four minutes before uh, law enforcement was called. Um, the reason that the, the, it was a, uh, there was a delay was because um, I, the week earlier, there, there was a very large coat rack um, in the vestibule. And what ha ha had happened is that rack, coat rack had fallen over the week before, made a very loud crash. So a lot of people had assumed that the, um, they assumed that the uh, that it was the same thing that happened, and, and as we know now, it wasn't. So, um, so once the PD again, they arrived with under 16, uh, 90 seconds, and then no loss of loss of life occurred. So, what we want to do is just train to move quickly, and we have to just survive and and wait and, and hang and commit to action uh, till the till law enforcement gets there. Another lesson that we learned that if you're in lockdown, you have to absolutely stay in lockdown unless you are 100% certain um, that you are no longer in danger. If you are in, if you are uncertain, stay in lockdown. What happened is at the Tree of Life, uh, there was a lull in the gunfire and um, uh, one of the, there was a broom closet and one of the, pe there was seven people in the broom closet and one of the uh, per people opened up the door and he was immediately shot and killed. And then what happened from there is the shooter actually came into the room and was looking for the light switch to turn the light switch on and this, these six folks were left in there. So if he had found the light switch, um, they, they would have been in a fight for their lives. So it's important once you're locked down, stay in lockdown. If somebody's knocking at the door and they're saying it's the police department, 
If you're not sure, don't open the door. If it's really the police department, they want to get in, they will get into the room. You can always call 911 and say, hey, I'm, this is where I'm at. And they will tell you if there's a cops around the other side of the door. Um, so there's other ways to do that, but just if you're in lockdown, stay, stay in lockdown. Um, the next slide, the next video is, this is Steve Weiss. He was there and he had gone through, um, as Brad, as, uh, Br uh, Brad Rossini's training um, a couple of months before the shooting and he talks about the importance of that training. So I'm just gonna go ahead and play this video and Rabbi, let me know if this plays okay. Hi, I'm Steve Weiss, and I'm going to talk about the events of the morning of October 27th at the Tree of Life congregation. I was there for morning services I would, as I would be on any Shabbat. Rabbi, can everybody hear that okay? Yeah, we hear it well. And at about 9.45, we started our morning services. Then a little after 9.50 in the morning, there was a loud crashing sound that was in the hallway outside of the congregational service in the chapel. And it sounded like somebody had dropped a tray of glasses, is what it sounded like to me. Two of the congregants that were in the room went running out to see if they could help somebody because obviously there was a problem. I was waiting to go out because the rabbi was leading a prayer and that prayer required 10 people to be in the room and I was the 10th person in the room. And about 15 seconds later, the rabbi finished the prayer. I walked into the doorway to leave the room, and there was a series of sounds that were unmistakable as gunshots. As I was standing in the doorway, I could actually see shell casings bouncing across the floor in front of me. I turned around and came back into the chapel and went over to the side aisle and reached the very back pew. At that point, the rabbi announced for everybody to get down that was in the room. I started to get down below the bench and realized that that's not what we had been trained to do. I immediately got up and started running towards the front of the room and across the dim of the elevated platform at the front of the room and out through a door. As I was leaving the room, there were gunshots that were starting to occur in the room. I went down a back stairway to warn the congregation downstairs that there were gun, that there was gunfire in the building. When I reached the downstairs area, several of the members of the downstairs congregation had already come into a back hallway. I, at that point, went back upstairs. Four people had come out of the chapel with me. Is it freezing on you again? Yeah, looks like it. Hang on. Um, Rabbi? Sure. I have a question. When he went out, saw that there was a shooting, went back in, went to the first row of a pew or whatever they want to call it, and then decided, no, we're not supposed to get down, why didn't he take that pew and shove it door to possibly delay anybody getting in the room and then run to the front of the room. Jimmy, you hear that, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't know. Um, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know if the pews were, were, uh, were, were, um, bolted to the floor. I don't know. These things, this thing was happening so quickly. And, um, so I don't know if he had that thought, but what he goes on to say, is that when he started to get down, he realized that um, when we talk about active shooter run high fight, um, he realized that was the incorrect thing to do is to hide, um, you know, to get down. He knew he had to move and, um, and, and move quickly and, um, and take people with him. And that's what he wound up doing, which as you'll see, if I can get this to work again, um, that's what he does and saves a lot of people. Um, Okay. Nope. 
it working? You back up, Rabbi? Can you yeah. see you got the video? All right. Here it goes again. Maybe just skip the video. Maybe yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. That we won't try that one again. So back to that question. So it's a good question, and I, I don't know. He doesn't discuss. About, about that, I don't know which way, if the doors uh, exit uh, were uh, opened out or opened in, and I'm just not sure. So when we talk about, uh, to, you know, to speak to that point, you have to have uh, that plan of what, what, if you're gonna run or if you're gonna hide or if you're gonna fight. He might have thought the shooter was too close. And we're gonna close with a video of one more survivor that actually talks about the shell cases coming into, um, in, into the uh, synagogue, but and maybe that's what it was. But I, again, it's a good question, and I don't know. So when we talk about having that plan, if you're going to evacuate, if you can, when we talk about run, hide, fight, if you can, if you hear something, if you can exit the property and get off the property, that should always be your first plan of attack. If you can get out and exit, exit the property. Um, leave the others, leave the leave the property. Take people with you. One others. Um, call 911 if you have information um, that's important. Um, if you're going to hide, hide, uh, find shelter, hide out. But if you're looking for shelter when this, when a situation's unfolding, like we kind of talked about earlier, it's going to be too late. You really should have a play, kind of a place in mind every time you go into into services, um, or even at work or where you work or work out or you know anything. You should always have kind of have that that plan in place. Um, take your take action and defend yourselves, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, so if you do decide to hide, um, what we the idea is to kind of be out of the person's view. The idea is to make the room that you're in look empty. So, um, so um, if the if the shooter walk, happens to walk by or look in the room, we just want it to appear to to appear um, empty. Um, if it can provide protection, that's perfect. If not, you have to work with what you've got. Time, again, you might not have time uh, to pick out the perfect hiding spot. If you are in a place with others, um, and we talked a little bit with the Tree of Life, do not huddle together. Absolutely, you've got to um, spread out um, on one side of the door and have, start making your plan that if the person does make it into your room, what's your plan? What are you going to do? Um, we talk about a group mentality, a group think mentality. It's a group think is a very dangerous thing. I've seen people do things in a group that they would never do by themselves. But if it's for the greater good, there's a lot of, there's power in numbers. So if you act as a group and as a group leader, um, be prepared to fight um, uh, if somebody comes into the room. Again, attack as a, as a group. Um, assume intentions are lethal, fight, uh, be committed to your fight. And, um, and I'll tell you this, and a bad guy in a bad situation, uh, if I was a bad guy and I was doing two or three people, very, likely they could overcome a bad guy. It's hard to do it virtually, but um, I, if I was a bad guy and I ran into, it went into your, your um, if you guys had, had a meeting um, as a group, you could, you could overpower me. There is, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind. So again, if you have that pre-selected uh, place to hide, um, that's perfect. It will save you that critical time. Uh, we say avoid being trapped if possible, if the place, if the room has another exit, that's that's even better, but you just might not have that that uh, uh, that luxury or availability. Um, again, hidden, protected, blockade the door with heavy furniture. Turn out the lights if you can um, think of it. Silence your cell phones. Um, stay away from windows and um, do not exit uh, if you hear the fire alarm is being pulled. Um, it's, this is kind of the new tactic now. If the fire alarm goes off, you stay in lockdown. Unless you smell smoke or you see open flames, we stay in lockdown. Um, again, if the shooter or the person committing this act of violence is too close, you have basically two choices. One is to fight or well, they're either to fight or comply. Um, how you re respond is based on the training, how you, the camaraderie of the group, your background, um, and your training. 
Um, if you're training, if the more we train and train and do these um, lockdown drills, the more um, uh, the more likely the plan, you know, you'll be eat quicker, quicker, you'll be able to put your plan in place. Um, but just keep in mind, it takes a couple minutes for the cops to get there. As good as Phoenix is and Scottsdale is, it's going to take them a few minutes to get there. Um, um, chances of survival may be greater, but things to consider, um, how many of you, how many will actually commit to, the, to an attack? And, and when we say commit, we actually mean commit and, and be as absolutely violent as you possibly can. Um, what objects, weapons are available to disable um, or kill a shooter? Um, what's, that, uh, what's that look like? What do those, those weapons look like? You should have that. Again, I know some of you guys carry weapons and OC spray with you. Make sure you have them available and be prepared to use them. Train with them. Um, training is absolutely critical. Um, does the group have a plan? What are the yards uh, that group think mentality? And who's the leader? Who's going to step up and take, take charge of the, of the situation? Um, the closer you are to a person, the better chances you have of overcoming somebody. Uh, that's just, that's just a, a, a fact. Again, we talk about violence, um, violence of action, and that is being as violent uh, for, for the greater good as you possibly can. Um, improvised weapons, we talked about weapons, hit, spit, scream. If anybody has a can of a soda can and you shake this up and you spray it at somebody, um, it's going to be hard to see if you can't, it's hard to, to, to um, to shoot or uh, commit violence if you can't see. But these are things that we have to think about prior to an incident occurring. Any questions on that? I have a question. You said if the uh, fire alarm is not to leave the building? If you're in lockdown and, some, and you have an active shooter or some sort of active violence and you're in lockdown and the fire alarm goes off, do not come out of lockdown. Um, because what they're doing now is they're pulling the fire alarm to get people, you know, we've been doing that since we were kids. The fire alarm goes out, we come out and we leave and we, um, uh, we leave and, uh, and exit the building. So what they would, they're doing, and they've done this in Florida, is they pull the fire alarms and people are, are actually coming out of lockdown to evacuate the building. Because that's what we've been trained, that's what I've been trained to do for the last 50 years. Oh, so you mean an active shooter will purposely set, do the yes. fire alarm and wait for people to go out of the building? That is correct. I see. I didn't understand. That's the reason why I said. Yes, that is. You're. You're. That's. That's correct. So that's what we say now. Um, um, just you've got to stay in that lockdown. Um, now we move into what happens when law enforcement responds. Um, when law enforcement shows up, just so what their plan is, and they, they train extensively on this, is that what they're going to do is they're going to what we call clear to contact. They're going to go in and they're going to look for the bad guy. Um, they are going to uh, step over people that are injured, hurt, and what they've got to do is they've got to neutralize and stop the violence um, as quickly as possible. So just remember, these guys are under a tremendous amount of stress. Um, they've got tunnel vision, auditory exclusion, so we just... When the cops go there, please don't make any quick movements. Don't run. Don't try not to scream or yell at them. Don't have anything in your hands if that's possible, a cell phone, anything that these guys can make a mistake um, under the, the intense stress that they are under. I can tell you as a law enforcement officer, there is no more stressful situation than when you're going into a house or something and you think that you are going to be involved in a lethal force encounter. I can tell you it is, the stress is, um, it's beyond, um, almost beyond human capability. It's that, it's that stressful. So these guys are under that pressure. So just do what they tell you to do. You might be handcuffed. You're going to get weapons pointed at you. It's going to be extremely, extremely violent, um, but just know they're doing their job. Okay. Don't have anything in your hands. Um, I have a video. Rabbi, how are we doing on time? Um, you, I think whoever's still on here is good with your time. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and we'll just bypass this video for now. Um, so just um, if they, if the law enforcement, be prepared to uh, tell them who the shooter is, the number of shooters, description, location, um, if the type, type of weapons, if it's a handgun, long gun, that's the kind of stuff, that's the kind of information um, they're going to want to know. Remember what we talked about, there's, a, there's an overwhelming chance you might actually know who this person is. 
Um, if you call 911, just a couple of things about calling 911. If you can give these things, physical description, clothing, direction of travel, all that, that's imperative. Call 911 if you have good information. If you don't know anything or you don't have any pertinent information, hold off on calling 911. In these situations, we find that um, not only do the people on scene start calling 911, but the texts go out and people that aren't even on the scene start calling 911. It becomes very, it confuses responding law enforcement. So if I, if I give a description of what I think the suspect is and then another person gives it the actual description and law enforcement gets two different descriptions, what are they going to think? They're going to think there's two shooters, right? And what's that going to do? That's going to slow their response down. So if you have information um, that's need to know, by all, by all means, call 911. But if you don't have any, any solid information be, um, besides that there's a shooting going on, just evaluate whether you have to call 911 or, or, or not. So we talk about um, acting with violence, acting with purpose um, is absolutely key. This next video, it's very short. This happened in Phoenix about two years ago in a Circle K, and I think it, it just goes to speak to that group mentality and how one person actually um, took charge of the group and without a doubt uh, saved some lives here. It looks like a scene out of a Hollywood blockbuster. Yet in May 2018, it happened here in Phoenix. Gas station hostages fighting back and subduing their attacker before making a dramatic escape. Hey, we got a robbery or something going on at Grand in 19th Avenue Circle K. At 9 that morning, customers can be seen entering and leaving the store, including this police officer. If only he had stayed a few more minutes. Moments later, this man enters, Joel McLean Carson. Within a minute, McLean shot and killed 24-year-old Ephraim Hernandez before turning his rage on the other people in the store. He said, this is not a game, this is not a joke, I don't want no money, I don't want no beer, I came prepared to die. McLean then orders an employee to lock the front door before he barricades it with a donut case. Someone's inside telling him to lock the door and yelling at him, and it happened pretty quick. Customers were then ordered to the back of the store with one man already dead. Security video catches the moment a customer fights McLean before all others join in. I'm not gonna lie, but I turned the gun to his stomach and I tried to go through it. I was my only instinct to get myself out of the situation. With the store now empty, McLean appeared dazed and confused. After almost an hour though, SWAT crews barreled in. McLean shot once but survived. A year later, he is still awaiting trial, facing murder and assault charges, all as video of his disturbing crime spree becomes public. In Phoenix tonight, Ryan Sips, Arizona's family. Um, I mean, I think that's, that video speaks for itself. Um, so when we talk about training, when we talk about doing tri uh, drills, communications, we talk, we've already done the stop the bleed training. Um, and just know, again, knowing your room numbers, knowing where you're at is, is abs absolutely critical to, uh, if something like this was to happen. That video, the one guy, if you listen closely, he says, I actually put the gun towards the guy's stomach and I tried to pull the trigger. It was my only instinct to get myself out of this situation. That's a very, I think that's a very, very powerful statement. Um, okay, I have, um, I, there's one more video and this is a tr another Tree of Life survivor. And he talks about, um, he goes on for a few minutes. Um, he's an older gentleman. He talks a little bit about um, being a little bit older and what he heard and how he reacted to that shooting and how quickly he was able to move, if you listen really carefully, um, even though he was a little bit older, how quickly he moved out of the way. And um, he makes some statements in this video that I are very extremely powerful. Tell what happened that day. Well, um, I came to uh, issue my usual time on, uh, uh, on Saturdays a little. Uh, Rabbi, can everybody hear the video? You hear the video, but we lost the uh, video from the screen. All right, I'll just let the video play. Some people there. Okay. Are usually coming on. Uh, they, uh, Rabbi. Uh, Motion to Audrey to start the service, which she, she did uh, with her uh, organist. And uh, I was sitting in my usual 
season of Woodrow, and we heard the noise. We heard a noise, uh, and I turned around, um, and I saw this man with a gun pointed at me. And um, I, am, I was not still for very long, less than oh, a few seconds. Uh, and at that point, I turned around, and Audrey and the rabbi were uh, trying to help the, 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 some of the uh, some of the people who were there get out of the way, but that turned out to be not, uh, not possible. And uh, I, uh, I don't remember my exact words, but basically I said, we all pointed me upstairs, and I said, let's go. And so Audrey went up, and I went up uh, on, the, uh, on the left side, where there was a uh, stairway all the way to the third floor. And the rabbi went over to the center and went up uh, also out of range and pulled his, uh, his uh, cell phone out and, and uh, called. Now, I wasn't sure who he called, but I knew he was calling. I thought it was, uh, it was uh, I, don't even know. I don't even know what I I tried to say what I was thinking, things were happening very quickly. Uh, but we did decide uh, without, without any real talking that, you know, we're there and when we should stay for a while. And um, we were, uh, it took about 20 minutes to begin to get fancy enough that we could think, well, we haven't heard anything. Uh, Did you hear all the shots then? No, I didn't hear any shots. No, maybe I was even in there. I really didn't hear any shots. Now, that may be because of my hearing, but, uh, um, <clears throat> and so we, uh, we decided, Audrey and I, that the logical thing was to, uh, go go out around uh, uh, the inside of the building as far uh, east as we could get, and then come down and go out the the, uh, the, the door. And uh, yeah, and there was. Uh, uh, some police, uh, um, women police, uh, who were uh, very helpful, got us to, got us across the street, put us in the uh, hands of uh, a young man who uh, took us down to a, uh, one of the numerous cars that was parked, and we got in there, and uh, Nobody told us to be quiet or anything like that, but we, we really uh, didn't find, I didn't, couldn't think of anything to say. We didn't really know what all this was about, except that they were shooting and that I had seen this guy, but... Uh, if you would have stayed in the chapel, what would have happened to you? I would, I would be dead. So that was Brad's, that was Brad's um, interview with him. And he asked him what happened. And he says he would obviously have been, uh, been killed. So I think it's a, it's a very uh, a powerful interview. So the point is, when something happens, you've got to move with purpose, move as quickly as you can, and, and, get, out, and get out of that situation um, absolutely as quickly as possible. I think that, inter that interview with him, to me, is, a, I, again, I find it very uh, insightful to somebody that was actually, we talk about a lot of this, but he was actually there. 
He does talk about that he never heard the shots because of his hearing. Um, we talk about under stress, the auditory exclusion might not hear as well as you think you will hear. So does, does anybody have any questions about what we talked about? Judy? Again, if you do, uh, I'll Hi, go. Jimmy. Jimmy, I'm the one that you um, uh, helped me with the pepper spray. Um, and I know it's off topic a little bit, but I do need to leave in two minutes and I have a question. Um, I have it right here. Did I get the wrong size? This is about six inches. It's, I thought it was going to be maybe two and a half inches. You, you, you did buy the big one, yes. There's a smaller one that you can buy. Um, okay. Because this one here, um, I needed two fingers to push it down. It was really tough to, if I got the smaller one, it's would gonna it be? It's going to be the same way. It's going to be, the, it's going to be the same way. And they make it tough to push because they don't want you to push it accidentally. Okay. They make, it that way, they make it that way on purpose. That's my question. So I need to do some finger exercises. You could. Muscular. I guarantee you under stress, you'll probably push that button just fine. Be careful that the wind doesn't blow it into your face. I know. Well, I know. and we talked about this with Judy. The wind, the wind will blow it in her face. That's going to happen. We know that because that's just how these, when you use this stuff, that's how it works. Um, and that's why with you, when you and I talked about, make sure we know, you know what it feels like and it's important to know exactly what that stuff can do. Jimmy, Jimmy's volunteering to spray it at you if you need to feel it. Well, <laughs> I was telling uh, Judy, and when we before we let the anybody carry it in the police department, we actually make we spray them with it and make sure they know exactly what it does. They used to do that with the taser too. And they, I also wanted to taser. ask. I also wanted to ask you if, let's say, you, there was some javelinas coming at you, would it stop them? Javeline animals don't have tear ducts, so they'll they will tell you that it won't work. But I. My guess is it would probably work because I've seen it. As we've used it with um, when we've used a canine, and it does. It does. It gets in the in the nose, and it it does. It 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 does change the you you know the it will deter the animal. Usually it does, but the company will tell you technically it's not supposed to be. And what about a snake? I don't know. I don't know. I've never used, <laughs> yeah, I've tried. I've never used it on a snake. That one I don't know. Run away. <laughs> I say, let's go hiking, Judy. Let's go find out. <laughs> May I say a word about the pepper spray versus pepper stream? Kimber Pistol Company imports from Switzerland a, a pistol they make or over in Europe that fires two streams you know, sequentially if you want to fire both of them uh, out 15 feet at 90 miles an hour. And there's no blowback. And the wind won't blow that back to you. So it's a, a device you can buy, and uh, it's really very nice. You carry it. It looks like a small little pistol. So do you have one? There's Jerry? lots of options out there. There's a lot. There is a lot of Jerry options. You can show it. Jerry will go get it so you can see it. We have one. And actually, Judy, my brother bought a, uh, he doesn't want to carry, so he bought a, personal taser. They sell personal tasers. You do have to know how to use them because of distance and how they shoot, but um, if you're, if you feel more comfortable. A taser is also a, a good option. Um, just the, the difference between the law enforcement taser and the uh, civilian taser is the law enforcement ta taser will only, when we pull the trigger, it will only go for 15 seconds and then it shuts off, whereas the civilian taser goes for 30 seconds. And the idea for that for a civilian is, because in law enforcement, we tase somebody and take them into custody. Um, in uh, the civilian world, you tase somebody and you're supposed to drop it and, and run. Run for your life. Run for your life. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's the main difference between the two tasers. But it's, it's also a very good, less lethal option. I tell you, though, that OC spray, I've used it a lot in my career, and it, it's, it's very, very effective. What did you say it was called? Is that... The OC. one, OC? OC spray. Judy, okay. you're muted if you want to. You're still muted, Judy. 
When I'm on my walks, I'm always looking for a tree that I can climb. I don't mind the um, coyote, I don't mind the bobcat, but I'm fearful of the javelina. They are big boys. <laughs> They're big and you know what, they, I learned this because um, I live way out and off of Rio Verde, is they can't see very well. And that's, that's mm -hmm. why they're so aggressive is because they can't see that well. So right. um, what's that? Yeah, they just can't see. But you're, I like your situational awareness. That's, that's what we talk yeah. about is having a plan. And whether it's because from an animal or, or a, a human being, it's, it's, it's yeah. always important to, to look around. I see people do this, and I, I know I've showed you, they walk around, they'll just be staring at their cell phones and walking through the parking lot here at the J all the time. And you know, yeah. if, if you're going to, you're just asking to become a, uh, a victim. Rabbi, <laughs> Rabbi. Oh, Jerry, you got it? Yep. Here's uh, what, spotlight you so everyone can see it. Yeah, make sure. Here's what now, Sandra. Pepper this Blaster is, too. This is the most advanced pepper spray available. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it's made by Kimber. Interesting. Yeah, they, they make yes. them in Switzerland, and they sell them in the United States. Yes. KIR pistol. You get on get on the web. You, you can buy it from them. Very interesting. You know, like I said, the good thing about these less lethal, if God forbid you lose it or it gets taken from you, you know, as with a firearm, they can't, they won't be able to use it against you. So I, I do like these options. Like they're, they're great options. The this biggest, really the biggest mistake people make with firearms, and we, I know we got into this the last time, is they buy the firearms and they don't train with them. Um, the couple in Missouri that took those two guns out when the crowd was in their neighborhood, um, how that woman didn't shoot the husband in the back of the head was was a miracle. You know, she had her finger on the trigger and um, they just were clearly not trained in the use of firearms. And that's the biggest mistake that people will go to the store, buy a firearm, and then and that's just not enough training. You've got to train and it's got to be continuous and continuous training. And if I understand correctly, since you're a firearms expert, I think he was holding his stock on the wrong side or something. Yeah. Yeah, he had it. He had it in a. I, actually, I don't know what that position was, but that's not the way we would ever hold a rifle. It's either up or down, port arms or low ready, but never, never in that position he had it in. So, um, yeah, and that's. I just felt that that's just a lack of training. Whoever sold them those firearms, you, you really need to. You really need to get training on them, and good training. Do you have any? Um, since I mean, I know we lost a lot of the crowd because of time wise, but I know that they'll watch recordings. Do you have anything specific that you would say uh, in the sense of run, hide, fight for seniors specifically? And I know that I actually appreciated that you used Tree of Life, which had that uh, older gentleman who fled. So uh, do you, what about in the sense of the fight part? If you... Yeah, we say if you're, if, if the situation and you have to fight, you have to commit to the fight. Um, and we talk about improvised weapons, the less lethal stuff, that stuff is fantastic because these guys are cowards and they're not anticipating a fight. So once you start fighting back with these less lethal options, um, it changes the scenario, it changes the situation that we find statistically. So once you commit to this fight, stay with the fight, be as violent as you absolutely can. Do not worry about um, injuring somebody or hurting somebody. That's just, that's, if that's how the situation unfolds, that's what happens if people get hurt. Um, that's, that's, you know, we never shoot or do anything to kill anybody. We only do it, we only protect ourselves and we shoot or we use uh, force to stop the situation. Commit, absolutely commit to being as absolutely violent as you can. Um, we want to overwhelm the suspect um, and we do that in numbers, violence, uh, improvised weapons, and, and um, as, qu as, as quickly as you possibly can. Oh, thank you. Any other questions anyone has? For uh, in, in Prescott, at our shul, Jimmy, for any larger holiday, let's say, of course, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, uh, Sukkot, we have been hiring two officers because we felt that one couldn't really cover the property that we're sitting on. And we have very really no options practically if someone would come in because of exits so the two officers is better right 
Yes, it is. If you can afford it, absolutely. Yes, it and it's expensive. That's the, you yeah. know, very expensive. It's expensive, yeah. um, but it's, you know, yeah. For the deterrent part of it, um, you know, it's worth it. Uh, yeah, two is two is better than one, depending on the size of the property. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, open air, it's tough. That those are very difficult situations. I know some of the some synagogues are planning open air services uh, for the high yeah. holidays. That's and what we're doing. That, yeah. that presents um, a, for uh, law enforcement. For it prevents a ch it's it's a challenge. It can be done, and that's why the two people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good decision uh, because again, it's it's not a closed, controlled environment. You're dealing with the elements and um, and distances, so it's a it's a good call. Thank do you, you uh, Jimmy. One do you can I say something? Yeah, go for it, Jerry. It's called Kimber's K I M B E R. They, they're manufacturers of the finest missiles in the world, I think. And also, this is a, called a Pepper Blaster II, Roman numeral II. Yeah, Kimber is uh, very well respected. That's, that's one of the top, top of the line, no doubt about it. Yeah. Do you, um, do you guys provide through your antebellum? So just something that Jimmy does on the side, for those of you who don't know. Um, he also has a private security group. So mm -hmm. for private events, synagogues, he didn't ask me to push this, but I'm just sharing. Um, do you provide also to Prescott if someone wants, or it's only in the county? So you could get out of the county. Okay. So Phyllis, maybe you guys need to do a price check. Find yeah. out if the uh, yeah. Prescott Valley Police Department is more expensive than Jimmy with, with uh, travel. Yeah. We've also... Expensive been very generous with our officers so that when we request I understand they sign up like that because we we do pay them well <laughs> and also we feed them <laughs> and 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 <laughs> okay. um, any other questions for um, Jimmy because I know we took a lot of your time Jimmy thank you no not at all thank not you all. sorry so about much. all the technical stuff uh, we have been having some problems here with the internet. We're doing the J group all day with the kids. Every kid in here is on a laptop right now. <laughs> so it might have been that. It might have been me too. So <laughs> you know, but uh, um, so I apologize for all that. No, don't worry about that. Oh, thank you, thank you. Of course. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, take care. You too.